The University of Detroit Mercy presents another edition of Ask the Professor. We want to do our part to stop the spread of COVID-19. So all of the professors are still following our governor's order to stay home and stay safe. And we're all connecting once again through Zoom video conferencing technology. University Tower Chimes bring in another session of Ask the Professor, the show on which you match wits with University of Detroit Mercy professors in an unrehearsed session of questions and answers. I'm your host, Matt Mayo, and let me introduce to you our panel for today. From the bottom of the screen, it's Professor Heather Hill. Oh, hello. <laughs> it's just you're at the bottom in, in my arrangement. Oh, I, Everybody I, sees it differently. I understand. It's... Uh... I'm, I'm, hello. <laughs> so why, Heather, is why is it snowing? I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. Some Tomorrow people, it's going to be nice. No. Promise? Yes. Okay. I, uh, Heather, I thought of you today because there was this big uh, plump um, bird that was uh, clearly, was it a robin, right outside my window with the snow swirling all around it. And I tried to get a, like a snapshot that would be all artsy and be like, oh no, what season are we in? And I was thinking of all of your flowers uh, peeking up from underneath the snow. Yes, there are some lovely blue hyacinths that are now covered with snow. Oh, they will be back. They're cold hardy. Good, good. I don't know how my tulips are gonna make it, but we will see. Next up, with fabulous art framed behind him, it's Professor Stephen Manning. Good afternoon, Matt, and everyone else. Good afternoon. How are you holding up, sir? Um, okay. Oh, good. <laughs> That's better than I've gotten from a lot of the times I've asked that question today. I've gotten in trouble with a few folks. I've been very honest when people are like, hey, what's up? I'm like, I'm terrible. They're like, oh, really? I'm like, yeah, global pandemic. Have you been, you know, paying attention? <laughs> <laughs> Just trying to be honest. People don't really want an honest answer to that question when they yeah. ask, generally yeah. speaking. Even when we're not in the pandemic. Uh, yeah, not in uh, in America, at least, Beth. I, I agree with that. Yeah, I think in Europe, they're more like uh, very just to the point, you know? Probably, yep. Yeah. I'm uh, scared to death to see what Professor Dave Chow has been sketching this whole time. Nothing, nothing at all. Pleasure to be here. Um, okay. I'm just taking notes for Michael, that's all. Okay. And drawing your own underwear. Maybe. I might be. <laughs> it helps having plenty of pads of paper around me, so. Absolutely. You know, from where your camera you is, Dave, what, what is that, Prasad? I was going to ask him whether we got the answer to the question, boxers or briefs. Oh. Uh -huh. Based on the drawing. Yeah. Briefs. For now. Looks like it's briefs. So, man, yeah. you're going to ask me what now? Oh, just from the angle of your camera, it sort of looks like you're in, you know, uh, some sort of broom closet. Yes, it's my it's my home studio. <laughs> okay. So, broom closet. That's all the wall, printer, <laughs> my own little cubby. Okay, okay. That's <clears> cool. <throat> oh, I like oh. it. It's cozy. It's snug. Okay. Um, next up, we have uh, what can only be described as the angriest digital representation of Professor Prasad Bajigapal. <laughs> yeah. You look like Apocalypse Now. <laughs> ah, thank you. That's a great compliment. <laughs> yes, there is that scene in that movie. I think this is actually, the background is a beautiful sunset from somewhere, India, I think. It, instead of putting the background in the background, it actually replaced you with the background. That should have been, that's what I should do. Everybody knows I have a face for radio and a voice for silent movies. Um, <laughs> happy to be here. Thanks for coming, Prasad. But you have part of a face, like the Phantom of the Opera. Mm -hmm. I like that better. I love it. Mm -hmm. Half my face is, uh, is gone. Yep. Professor uh, Jim Tubbs is with us again today. Hello, hello. How much of snow were you are, Jim? Well, it's it's kind of a light dusting, but it was pretty watching it fall. Yeah. Just so, odd to be doing it this time of year, but, you know, it's Michigan. Yeah, the last vestiges of winter, uh, you know, coming back to haunt us here. Can't be stopped. Although next week is like all 50s and 60s and clear. So uh, this is Mother Nature's last gasp. 
Professor Beth Oljar is here with us today. Good to be here. You have a, a pretty studious uh, background. If I didn't know any better, I'd say I was talking to like the governor or uh, some of these uh, newsy types. They always have books be behind them, you know. Uh, it's my office at home, but also behind me is a picture from Ask the Professor and uh, the Zombie Beth calendar from 2012-2013. So uh, it is not all serious, believe me. <laughs> Brains. Oh my gosh. Actually, Beth, have you heard that there is this uh, Facebook group out there that basically, for lack of a better description, sort of analyzes the backgrounds of people when they're at home um, doing Zoom calls and stuff like that? They zoom in, see what books you have on your shelf, try to sort of psychoanalyze? These are people who are really too desperate for things to do. <laughs> I should say, they've <laughs> been home too long. Books instead of analyzing people's psychology based on the books that they have? Yeah, something, something like that. <laughs> All Dave has is a giant copy of his head. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, if, if they want to look at essays on Aristotle's ethics, you know, and derive claims about my character from that, they're happy to do. They're they're welcome to. That's what that's what I I figured you were going to say too. It'd be like, well, I've got a lot of philosophy. Is anybody really shocked by this? You know. <laughs> Professor Mara Livesey is here with us today. I sure am. Happy to be here. You brought sweets, but uh, sadly, not for everybody. Not for everybody this time, but I can't wait until the next time that there's a bake-off at ATP with Dan. <laughs> I think you better put the scotch ruse on the short list. I will do that. They're quite easy. Mm -hmm. Love them. Easy is just about my speed, too. We haven't gotten into the uh, the baking thing because mostly we get to the end of the school day with a 10th grader, a 6th grader, and a 2nd uh, grader in my house, and we just basically just go to bed and wake up and do it again the next day. So uh, Nothing wrong with that at all. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Professor Dan Maggio is here with us today. Hi, Matt. It's great What's to be going here. going on, Dan? Not much. Um, going to make uh, corn muffins this weekend injected with raspberry jam oh on a God. recipe. That sounds really Ooh. good. And when I'm done with that, I'm going to try to figure out how to cut my own hair. So <laughs> hair. <laughs> that's my weekend project. I'm just like a look at it. I'm like, how can I cut my own hair? So things are desperate here. I'm uh, I'm this close to, you know, doing everything. Here. I just can't handle it anymore. I need a haircut, but I also made orange spice sugar cookies that were good. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Everybody needs to bring all this stuff in when we get back together. Yeah. Hey, folks, this is a program where you can send us questions regarding anything. Frankly, it's been a while since we've had a good old-fashioned cookie-based uh, um, question set. If you stump the panel, you win a prize. If you don't stump the panel, you win a prize. You can send us the questions in a number of ways. You can email us at atp at udmercy.edu. You can reach us on the web at udmercy.edu slash atp. You can ask uh, Hermie and uh, Rudolph to send something in if you want to. You can find us on Facebook or listen on your favorite smart speaker by asking it to play Ask the Professor at University of Detroit Mercy. Okay. We've got a set of questions from longtime question sender. Hi there, profs. Hope you're all continuing well and happy as one can be under these circumstances. Out here in beautiful downtown Hygiene, Colorado, where the population doubles every calving season, we're enjoying weather normally reserved for the first week of February. I've been thinking of these questions for a while. So here are a few questions on the theme of, let's see what happens to Dave Chow's eyes here. Um, the TV show, The Flintstones, are these questions. Oh. Wait, is it hygiene as an H-Y-G-I-E-N-E? Oh, that's absolutely true, yeah. Mm -hmm. Fabulous. <laughs> Lowest rate of coronavirus infections? Well, it's all no? cows, it sounds like, so probably true. <laughs> Something about calves, something about coronavirus. Uh, what was Wilma and Fred's saber tooth cat's name? Kitty, I believe, wasn't it? No, it wasn't. Tabby. Mm -mm. Fluffy. It's no, it had a, a human diminutive name? Tiny. Getting closer, getting closer. Tinier? <laughs> <laughs> 
it was named uh, Baby. It was named Baby. Oh, really? Okay. Very cute. Very cute. Uh, Meet the Flintstones wasn't the original theme song of the show during the first and second seasons when it wasn't understood the show would be such an enduring hit. An instrumental was played. Do you know what the name of the song was? If you think about the opening sequence, you might be able to sort of like extrapolate this. Well, like the drive-in, the monster. Mm. Driving with your feet. Yeah, get it, getting closer. What what does the very first part of the show actually show? Do you remember? Uh, Fred leaving work. Fred leaving Winning work. Time. Driving home. Well, toning his dinosaur down and then then going home. Yeah, right. Sliding and down. Coming the in the front door. So the the very first part of the show actually showed him going to work. It, the the show's theme was called Rise and Shine because that was the only. Oh, part Rise and Shine. Okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. It says here that the. Uh, um, Meet the Flintstones song is actually based on movement two of Piano Sonata number 17 by who? Hmm. Ah. Beethoven. I'm giving you the B, though, Beth. Yeah, it's Beethoven. Um, Beethoven. Oh, okay. Very interesting. The voices of Fred, Wilma, and Betty were chosen deliberately to imitate their counterparts on The Honeymooners, but Barney ended up sounding, didn't sound end up uh, like much... I'll try again, but Barney didn't end up sounding much like Ed Norton. Why was Barney uh, so different sounding than Ed Norton from the Honeymooners? Because Mel Blanc was in the hospital when he did most of those voices. Yeah, that's right. As a matter of fact, they wow. wanted Mel Blanc really bad, and he made it very clear in his contract, quote, I don't do impersonations, unquote. Mm. So he made up the voice of Barney Rubble. Extra, extra credit. For a while in season two, Barney was voiced by another actor. I think you were getting close to this, Dave. Uh, Dawes Butler? Um, no, actually, I'm not looking for it. Just the oh. reason why. Oh, Mel Blanc was in an auto accident. He That's did it right. in a body cast. Off. That's right. Wait, okay. come back. <laughs> hmm? Let's see here. June Foray perhaps uh, best known for being the voice of Rocky the Flying Squirrel and Granny Hazel, who was the owner of Tweety Bird in Looney Tunes, auditioned for a part in the Flintstones. She didn't get it. What part was it? Betty? It was Betty Rubble. Yeah, Betty Rubble. Thank you. Sure. Fred Flintstone uh, was in line to receive a sizable inheritance from a rich uncle. Do you know the name of Fred Flintstone's rich uncle? Like, like a J.P. Got Rocks or somebody, somebody like that? Did it have rock in it? Was yeah. it, was it bed, like bedrock, wasn't it? You're, you're really, really close. How about... Like Rockefeller kind of thing? Lots of... <laughs> what if I say overpriced hamburger restaurant with a lot of guitars? Hard Rock? There we go. Got it. Oh, Perfect. Hard rock. Perfect. Come on, Dan. We won, we won the I know. That contest there, remember? We did, but it sounds familiar. Okay. Hard Rock, not that. How much is it estimated, using regular material mass, that Fred's car must weigh? <laughs> Three mm. times. See. No, no, you're a little bit over the top, Jim, but you're in the right uh, order of magnitude. How much did Jim say? Uh, Jim said three tons. Well, uh, yeah. like 1.6. Two. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> point four. 865 kilograms, so it's basically just about a ton. One ton. Hmm. One, ton. Well, one for each tire and the wood. Canopy couldn't weigh that much. So <laughs> I believe that giant um, rolling rock cylinder is what we're yes. uh, going to front and the, the back. That's the weighty part. <laughs> what, this you mean the wonderful. weigh that much too? <laughs> There's going to be no way around this for Prasad, so I hope he has his ears perked up. Let's see. Um, there is a Physics of Fred Flintstone um, expert oh. day. <laughs> on the internet that says, given that Fred likely weighs about 95 kilograms, what's the top speed at which he could probably be capable of making the 865 kilogram rock mobile go? That's great. You can give us a response in miles per hour. 
Now, okay, now <laughs> one half yeah, of so one mile per hour. <laughs> <laughs> On a flat oh, no, yeah. downhill. Jim, <laughs> that's a good point because it says what is the theoretical top speed? So this would be just like totally cranking it, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> would, but, uh, would that depend on the surface too that you're driving on? I would say we better be in the salt flats. Yeah, two miles per hour. It's about a tenth it's of a meter. Than that. It's higher. Hmm. Wow. Fred's got ten strong feet. miles an hour. It's higher than ten. What? No. Higher than ten? Seventeen. <laughs> I have to give it to Heather. It's uh, the old residential twenty-five miles per hour is the absolute top speed. Absolute top speed. Yeah, that sounds down like downhill, downhill to me. It's ridiculous. <laughs> yeah. I don't, By the way, and I, I, have, I have to see the math on this one. <laughs> you can put that in your final exam, Prasad. I am. <laughs> yeah. You got that right. <laughs> oh, you're going to use that next week, Prasad? Yeah, can you uh, just send me a copy of that, including the solution, so I don't have to work the solution again? <laughs> <laughs> oh, my gosh. This is hilarious. Thanks for those questions, Farah. Those are awesome. We've got some more questions here. Quarantine questions. Hello, Prof. It's been a while since I submitted any. Now that we're all isolating, I have some time to put together a highly intellectual quiz tangentially related to current events. Below is a series of eight questions about yours and my favorite topic, toilet paper. <laughs> Putting up this quiz will yield a passing grade. I'm going to steal that for my next exam. That's awesome. Putting up with this quiz will yield a pep. <laughs> <laughs> um, all the best is always Nat Pike of Livonia, Michigan. Oh, this I'm, is wonderful. I'm flush with excitement. <laughs> I'm just wiped out by this one. Oh, my God. Oh, God. I'm not going there. Not going not. there. I'm just going to mute myself and allow you to just take over the rest of the show. The first U.S. patent for toilet paper was issued to Seth Wheeler in 1883 after improving on what was called Gaetti's paper, introduced in 1857. But the product had actually been used for hundreds of years in what country that's not the United States? Japan. That's not what it says here. No. India. Germany. Saudi Arabia. Egypt. Poland. It's Canadian typing paper. <laughs> <laughs> it says a document attributed to uh, an ancient scholar in this country, 589 AD, quotes, paper on which there are quotations or commentaries from the five classics or the names of sages I dare not use for other purposes. China. China, yes, there we go. Mm-hmm. Stephen chimes in with China. What company? He used some of it when he was there. <laughs> what what company often sold the first rolled toilet paper? This is a fairly well-known paper company. Scott. Scott, yes, Scott. <clears throat> Sounds like we're saying that some like single person came up to it, but you know, you get the idea. It was. Uh, it says here, uh, 1890. The Scott Paper Company began selling toilet paper by the roll. What, well, I'm sorry, when Scott brand toilet paper was first introduced, it was sold as a medical item. Why? Hygienic? Clean? Um, yeah, kind of, but not really. Let's just say that in the middle of COVID- sold it to hospitals. What was that, Prasad? They first sold it to hospitals. Nope, that's not the reason. It was absorbent. Uh, you're you're be all being too logistic and not thinking about the social implications. Social implications. Social implications. Like in as in hygiene, Colorado kind of social implications. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's because um, when people asked for it by name, uh, they were embarrassed to purchase it, so it had to be sold as a medical uh, device. Uh, instead of what it actually was. Yes, I'd like a roll of buttock napkins. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my word. Oh, my God. <laughs> now, this is a fairly well-known piece of TV trivia. TV or TP? TV. 
Oh, okay, gotcha. Uh, okay. In 1973, a famous person inadvertently caused a toilet paper shortage. Who was it? Uh, Richard Nixon? The president? Yeah, no. It has to be someone with some pretty far-reaching ties, right? The Pope? What year was this? Uh, December 1973. Oh. Henry VIII. Um, the Beatles. The Queen. <laughs> Santa Claus. 73. 73. What, the, what personality? Personality. Henry Kissinger? Nope. Uh, I'll give you a little bit more of a clue. It's. Uh, I'm sorry, Heather? What? Oh, I thought you had responded. I'm sorry. I said Johnny Carson. Yes. Oh, Beth. Uh, oh, yes, my. Johnny Carson. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. It says um, on December 19th, 1973, Johnny Carson read a real newspaper clipping about a toilet paper shortage and made a few jokes. The public didn't realize the story had been about commercial paper, and consumers hit the stores the very next morning and created essentially a national shortage. It took some stores in some parts of the country three weeks before they were able to restock their shelves. Well, that's about as logical as the current shortage, frankly. Most of us aren't going to the restroom at work or at restaurants anymore. We're doing it at home, and consequently the purchases of toilet paper for home use are probably increasing over what they would normally be when you have a fully functioning economy. Which Ed, is you just going to work in schools and restaurants and bars mm -hmm. and movie theaters. And exactly, exactly. Beth, you just made me realize where I can find four large rolls of toilet paper. I'll be going to school tomorrow. <laughs> I'll be letting public 50 yeah. now. <laughs> got one hour. You've actually got two not... markets, a commercial market and a residential market, and the residential market is being strained because the commercial market is obviously not, you know, what it Well, was. it's also being strained by the people coming out of Costco with a whole pallet of, of right. toilet paper. Right. I just don't think we should talk about toilet paper and use the word strained in the same sentence. Mm. Something just doesn't work. Let's move on. In 1391, 1391, the emperor in China began using a very special type of toilet paper designed for the royal family. What was so special about this paper? It was, scent was scented? Mm -mm. No. Gilded edges? Nope. It had his name on it? It was two-ply. It was two That's a good one, though. It wasn't two-ply, no. Was it <laughs> It had a fortune. It had a fortune wrapped in it. it had images of all his enemies. It was colored with expensive ink. No, a mega roll. It was for some ungodly reason cut two feet by three feet. Must have had a big. Wow. Must a have large had a big bum. <laughs> um, Must have been like years. Henry VIII. Uh, Nat has supplied all sorts of uh, side notes here, and the side note next to that one is, what could possibly be more fun than this question? <laughs> <laughs> oh, my. Oh. What um, new feature, and this is, this is carried to this day, what new feature did Charmin uh, toilet paper have beginning about 1932? Well, it was perforated. Uh, perforated. Uh, no, um, Heather, what was your comment? Quilted? Nope, not quilted. Nope. The hollow no. plastic tube that made it squeeze easier? Mm -mm. Two ply. It not came in multi-packs? Multi That's exactly it. It, was the, it started coming in four packs. Yeah, that was it. <laughs> now, I have a question. Who came up with the idea of four as opposed to six or eight or 12? Or Costco, which is like, you know, 84. Yeah. <laughs> I think it was like one roll per family member with the average American family being 2.2 uh, kids and two adults. There you go. Oh, okay. So everybody gets their own roll? Do you have to carry your roll around or do you have four dispensers in the bathroom? That would actually not be a bad idea. Just hand one roll to everybody and say, that's it. You're on your own? You're on, You're your, on own. your own. <laughs> You know, by the way, Beth, I can't help but uh, bring up this anecdote, your your comments about the commercial toilet paper market versus the personal. 
or the house, uh, household toilet paper market. We're about a week and a half in um, a few weeks ago to the kids being homeschooled. And I said, how do you think things are going? And my wife paused and said, do you think our toilets can take this? That was her first <laughs> comment. <laughs> so, well, there you go. More than ever before. Is roller ruler considered essential? Mm -hmm. oh, I really hope so. I have a question. Professor about toilet paper. Is there a proper way to hang it on the roll? Oh, oh yes. yes. Oh, yeah. It depends on whether you have a cat. Is it? You know, where, 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 <laughs> what do people do? Actually, Jim, that is true. If oh, you have a cat, over. it needs to hang the, 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 the wall. hanging down needs to be next to the wall. If you don't have a cat, you can be normal. Oh, normal. normal. Good answer. Good answer. Hang it, hanging down the front. Yes. I see Professor Livesey really uh, reacting here. Oh, hanging down the front is normal. normal. Yeah, that is normal. Yes. <laughs> how else would you, everybody, how everybody else would you do it? That. What did you say, Stephen? I said everyone knows that. <laughs> yeah. No comment. No comment. No comment. Clear all all normal people know that. Okay. Okay, we're not getting in the middle middle of that, but I just want to say, uh, Matt and Mara. I mean, if I find any of those toilet paper rolls missing from the chemistry bathroom, I mean, like. Ooh, there might be a little uh, problem there because I know that maybe a student already had that same idea. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Let's try a couple more of these. These are hilarious. In 1935, what did Northern Tissue advertise their toilet paper as to get more people to buy it? Splinter free. That is exactly <laughs> correct. Splinter free. Seriously? Yeah. yeah, we had that question about a month or two ago. We're so grateful. Oh my God. Mm -hmm. I love splinters in my toilet paper. <laughs> <laughs> Cleans better. Oh, I love that. that. Look at that. Can I have that? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Let's, uh, Is that auto wipe? <laughs> Rewind if you have to. Oh my gosh. Everything has come to toilet humor, even on Ask the Professor. Yeah. I don't know what else to say. Yeah. We have one more question. Uh, these questions were really great, uh, Nat. Please keep sending them. And we like the, uh, the bite sized question sets. This one had eight questions, all with a theme. That, that always fits really well with our shows. What special feature did the Old Farmer's Almanac have that made it distinguishable as a source of toilet paper? Splinter free? No, but I'm surprised edges? you knew that off the top of your head. One ply. Mm -mm. A prasad? <laughs> Was it a prasad? No. So you mean using the actual Farmer's Almanac as toilet paper it was biodegradable? No, for the longest time, the Farmer's Almanac has printed er, itself on a newsprint, basically, whatever that kind of paper is called. We've got Dave Chow here. I know he knows newsprint. his Newsprint. But uh, uh, the bottom line is it had a Nine special pages. feature. What I was, was going to say no staple. <laughs> no staple. No staple. Uh, Heather, you're getting really close. Uh, no and man, did you really say the bottom line? It was, it was easy to take apart. Yeah, like it wasn't bound traditionally. You did say bottom line. Getting closer, getting closer. Unbound. No. You know, no I can actually no remember glue. this um, because my, my third grade educated Italian grandfather um, sub subscribed wholly to the uh, Farmer's Almanac from the time I was young. You could only buy the Farmer's Almanac during that time. So 60s, 70s, 80s, I think with a hole punched in the upper corner so that it would hang and you could easily rip out a page. Oh, oh. functional. So yes. they actually meant it to be used as toilet paper when you were done? Absolutely. How perfect I for your privy. Mm -hmm. What's the correct way to hang a farmer's almanac? <laughs> On a hook. <laughs> Depends if you have a cat or not. On a nail. <laughs> How many cats? You can only hang the farmer's almanac for use as toilet paper one week after the forsythias have blossomed. <laughs> hmm. What do you use during the winter, dare I ask? Oh my gosh. Icicles. <laughs> this, no. um, I didn't expect <laughs> things to go the way that they went, but yet I did. Does that make any sense? They went south. <laughs> 
Uh, unfortunately, How many, more questions? How many more questions? Oh, that that's that's all the questions we have for today, Professor Hill. So I'm afraid uh, the time has come for us all to say goodbye. Dan. Goodbye. Mara. Farewell. Beth. Be quarantine. <laughs> Jim. Wipe on. Bite sized toilet paper questions. Dave. See ya. Steven. Signing off. I take it we're never doing this again. <laughs> <laughs> Heather. It will stop snowing eventually. <laughs> and now these words from University of Detroit Mercy. Ask the Professor is transcribed at the facilities of the Briggs Building in the Department of Communication Studies in the College of Liberal Arts and Education at University of Detroit Mercy's McNichols campus, question mark? No, it's coming from our basements and spare rooms. Ask the Professor is produced and technically directed by Michael Jason with help from Brian Masonville and our executive producer is Professor Jason Roach. Until next week, I'm your host, Matt Mile.